Charles, and thanks Karen, and thanks to FACET for hosting, and thanks to each one of you. Uh, really appreciate everyone attending uh, today to see and discuss brainwashed sex kind of power. It is an essential conversation about representation across gender identity, race, age, and more, plus how power in filmmaking has influenced a legacy of cinematic practices that leads to bias, diminishment, and violence. We'll also talk about solutions and changing process and systems to move the issue of representation in film beyond binary gender toward equity and fairness to representation. So we want to welcome award-winning and highly lauded director, director Nina Menkes, uh, joining us virtually up there. Hi, Nina. And I want to start with, uh, with Nina. I know we want to center today on solutions and the next generation of filmmakers. Many are with us uh, right now. This is to literally redirect the bias that has dominated films for the past 120 years of cinema. I also want to start with how you, Nina, first encountered what you call the cinematic language law of sexualizing women uh, characters in film when you were in uh, school at uh, UCLA in the 80s. Were you aware of this tendency before film school, or was it just overwhelming studying what are called the film masters? <laughs> Sorry. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah. Hello. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you, Michelle. And hi, everybody. Um, we're really excited to be here and very honored uh, to have this panel and this screening and look forward um, to hearing the audience reactions and the great questions. Um, the, the idea that um, I just want to clarify that I, in the film and, and my position is that it's a so-called law. You know, it's not a law, it's a so-called law. It appears to be a law. One could deduce that it's a law, <clears throat> but there are many exceptions. And, and um, those exceptions are, you know, the shining light um, the, and the solution that you're talking about. Um, but as far as my own personal experience, I had an unusual um, home growing up, home situation. Uh, I grew up in Berkeley, uh, which was kind of very forward thinking uh, atmosphere. And we did not have a TV in my home. And so I never watched TV. And I occasionally went to films here and there. Uh, at the Pacific Film Archive, which had, you know, sort of more interesting kind of fare. Uh, when I came to UCLA, um, again, this is, a, this is before internet, this is before video stores appeared in the late 80s. So you really just saw the films that were shown to you in class, and they were, of course, generally the white, cis, male, hetero directors. Those were the masters. Um, and I did feel um, alienated from those films. I didn't really have a language for it at the beginning, um, but I sort of had a revulsion uh, effect. Um, so I, I know that, you know, some people say like, oh, I just completely loved those films. So when I saw Brainwashed, I was like freaked out, you know, it's like, oh no, it's my favorite film. You ruined my favorite film. Uh, so as, as our, one of our interviewees said, Rena Ahrens, uh, she said, well, we didn't let the cockroaches into the kitchen. We just turned on the lights, you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it was sort of, um, a process and then relatively late in, in my own filmmaking, like after I'd already made three features, um, going on pure instinct, which is just my own way. I'm intuitive. Um, I was introduced to Laura Mulvey and, you know, some of these other great writers, Audrey Lord, Bill Hooks, Judith Butler. And then I started having a language for talking about it. So that language then I brought back into the filmmaker sphere, the production sphere, you know, let's look at shot design you know, and let's look how shot design is this underlying river, you know, that that is sort of pervasive, regardless 
of context and decade and et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, that's uh, basically um, my answer for now. <laughs> Great. Thank you for that. I, I, I love uh, talking about having a language for it and having to being able to name it and uh, uh, be eloquent about it. So thank you for that. We have so many more questions for you. Um, okay. I, I want uh, to ask a question of uh, Michelle Yates, Associate Professor at Columbia College Chicago in the Humanities, History and Social Science Department. Michelle, you stated that Hollywood and mainstream film constitute a gender binary that is restrictive and problematic, and that many are looking to find solutions to subvert and resist that uh, culture. I want to hear from you what you feel young filmmakers are doing to create solutions and erase that historic tendency to objectify persons and what Nita calls the shots we take for granted. Um, thank you so much, Michelle. And um, I also want to thank you so much for inviting me to be here. Um, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to get to talk. Um, so, um, you know, at Columbia, like, Michelle and uh, Charles both said, I'm an associate professor and I uh, do teaching and research in both the environmental humanities and in feminist media studies. Um, and my research tends to focus on um, uh, environmental messaging in popular Hollywood film. Um, and so like a lot of my writing most recently has been about um, the white male savior trope in Hollywood films that deal with climate change. So Interstellar, Mad Max Fury Road, um, The Day After Tomorrow. And I think in all of those films you see also um, the constitution of a male gaze as well, not just on women, but also on the environment um, and on land as well. Um, and so, you know, this idea that these these things are are connected, um, women's issues and feminist issues and environmental issues. Um, but I also get to teach really cool classes at Columbia, and one of my favorite classes to teach is called Feminism and Film. Um, and I do um, get a lot of students, um, film study students, who are aspiring filmmakers in that class. Um, and it's really um, an amazing opportunity to talk to them about, um, to have them read Mulvey, to talk to them about the male gaze, to talk to them about employment discrimination, um, to, um, I, and thank you so much for this film, Nina um, and Maria, because I'm gonna show this film in my the next time I get to teach. Uh, that class, this film is perfect for that. Um, and so I think students, um, it's not that they're not unaware, especially the kinds of students who are gonna take feminism and film. Um, they're not unaware of the male gaze, but I think the class provides them a language for talking about what they're already seeing. And a lot of these students are really, really committed to wanting to make films that are more diverse, um, that are telling more diverse stories, that have more diverse casts. Um, where they're collaborating with more diverse um, people behind the scenes. Um, but they're asking questions, like a lot of the same questions that the film subjects in this film are asking too, which is, you know, um, how do I represent, um, you know, women as like sexual embodied beings, but without representing them as objectified? Um, and I think. You know, for me, as a teacher, I'm constantly saying to them, well, if you want to be a filmmaker that subverts the male gaze, um, you need to have a really good grasp of um, film analysis. And you need to, you know, look at film, look at the film that's out there through a critical lens. And I think um, this film also is a really good example of why that's incredibly um, important for students to do. You have to see what's out there so that you can, in your own work, uh, work to undo that. So I'll, I'll end there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Next, um, I want to hear from, and we all want to hear from, Maria Guy's <coughs> producer, producer of Brainwash. Maria is a feature film director and longtime member of the Directors Guild of America. And she, in 2015, became the person to instigate the historic ACLU and EEOC investigations into systemic discrimination against directors identifying as women. Yes. Her, right, thank you for that. 
her groundbreaking work literally put the term woman director on the map and uh, rocked the industry and helped lay a foundation for the Me Too movement that would follow just two years later. So Maria, uh, do you think who makes the film is the problem? And if so, is having a more diverse pool of directors the solution? Thank you so much, Michelle. I just wanna say it's such an honor to be here with, I've been reading about you all on the panel and I'm so grateful to be here with you. And I really wanna thank Karen Cardarelli and um, Suzette Bross <laughs> and Judy. <laughs> and I just um, thank you for having me here. Um, absolutely, uh, uh, who makes um, the, the, the content um, is gonna determine what that content is. And as we say in the film, 80% uh, of the entertainment media content that's distributed around the world comes from Hollywood. So if there's this little group of people who's creating, has an incredible amount of influence and is creating all this content, um, then it's literally silencing and censoring the voices of people who identify as women all around the world. It is, you know, creating a two-class structure cleaved by gender. So it's really, really important that we open these jobs up there. This is about employment. And that was um, what I discovered back in 2012. And when I reached out to Nina Menkes and we became wonderful friends after that and all of these incredible things have happened since then. Um, but I really understood that if I could hold Hollywood accountable in some way for the unlawful, the little, literally criminal um, violation of Title VII, which is equal employment opportunity law, then we could get somewhere. I had thought that my union, the Directors Guild of America, was the best place to start because all these wonderful liberal, you know, male directors that I looked up to, you know, Steven Soderbergh and Michael Apted, who were the president and the secretary of the guild um, when I was beginning this work, uh, but I was astonished. They did not want to help <laughs> and um, they didn't want to disrupt the, uh, the system at all, as a matter of fact. And so I realized I had to go to a bigger bully and I went to the ACLU. Um, I actually first went to the EEOC and I wasn't getting any traction there. So I went to the ACLU and I basically had to become a lawyer. I had to create a whole legal brief and you know count movies and count directors and and all of this was made possible because the of the advent of the internet and social media where i could go and actually count uh count statistics and who you know who who is directing these things so we really were able to make a revolution and and i think now that we're getting women's voices and people who identify all across the spectrum and a great deal of diversity um, into our films and, and TV shows and commercials, it's, it's going to change culture globally. Thank you so much, uh, Maria. Thank you for your advocacy and, and hard work. Um, I want us to hear from Rebecca Fons, Director of Programming at the Gene Siskel Film Center, a public program of the School of the Art Institute at Chicago, of Chicago. Rebecca, you also serve as development and program director for the historic Iowa Theater. So um, others have been, along with you, Nina um, and Maria, have been working on identifying and making us all aware of this intentional skewing of images and roles of characters identified as women in fictional films. So what is your take on how other filmmakers can act to not only call out this mandate, but to erase it? and create a visual style based in inclusion and equity. Thank you for that question. And I echo Michelle, just thank you for uh, this invitation from Facets and to share this, this stage and virtually and in person with these wonderful voices. Um, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm not a filmmaker. I'm married to a filmmaker, actually. Um, uh, and I think I, I have a perspective as a programmer of, of film festivals and a programmer of, a, of an exhibition space like Facets. The Gene Siskel is an art house cinema space that that prioritizes independent voices, um, international voices, and it's sort of challenging. We don't play Top Gun, I guess is the easiest thing to say. Um, uh, no, they'll never say never, right, Charles? Um, 
but I think, you know, I, and I have sort of a perspective that I've, I've spoken to, film, to filmmakers and students, I've spoken to Inez's classes in the past, uh, class in the past, and I have sort of a Pollyanna, like, um, rose-colored glasses, like, um, brief that I, that I say, which is, as filmmakers, you should think about where, who's showing your films, and you should think about those spaces really critically. Um, I think filmmakers, especially film students, they just want to get their work seen. And I think sometimes that means they can just say, you know, any screen that's going to put my film up is, is yeah, great. That's great. I mean, if you get a call, you know, from Sundance or you get a call from the Berlin Film Festival, like, great. Why wouldn't you jump on a plane and go and see your film in front of all these people? But I think it's sort of like a job interview. Um, you know, if, if an interview is, if the interviewer is going to, you know, look at the interviewee and look at their CV and their history and who they are and, you know, peek at their Facebook page, the interviewee should do that as well. You know, is this somewhere I want to work? So is this a film festival that I want to show my work? Do they have a, a hiring practice that is transparent and fair and equitable? Do they have a festival with a history of discrimination? Do they have a festival that has wheelchair ramps? Do they have a festival that cares about the people that are going to see their films? Are they going to take care of me? Are they going to pay me? I think these are sort of things that filmmakers can do, and I say it's Pollyanna-ish because I, you know, if you're a, a sophomore in film school, you're just like crossing your fingers that your, your work is going to get seen. So maybe this is sort of a, a dynamic that only works at, when there's a certain amount of power in the, the filmmaker's um, hands. But I think there is something that a, a, f a festival can, can be kind of taken to task around and about by filmmakers who could say, actually, you know what? I know you want to show my film, but can you talk to me about how you're going to take care of my film? Because my film maybe is like brainwashed, or my film is about um, something very personal, or my film is about um, a, a topic that's going to be challenging for the, for the festival attendees. So I think it's thinking about the places where we show films, especially um, also film exhibition spaces. How is that film going to take, be taken care of, and how is that film going to be represented, and how is that filmmaker going to be able to connect with audiences in a way that is substantial, like today. I mean, I think this, you know, this film could be presented in a vacuum, go by, get your popcorn, and see you later, but we're having this really substantive conversation, and so like, I think we're all having a, an experience that's gonna be quite memorable for us. So it just goes to show where your film plays and how it's shown is as important as the people who green light it or don't. Uh, that's so interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. Not all film festivals are created equally. So thanks, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, right? Um, let's hear now from uh, Inez Summer, filmmaker, cinematographer, associate professor of instruction, and associate director in the MFA Documentary Media Program at Northwestern. Go Wildcats. <laughs> and as, as you know, <laughs> many documentaries focus on strong women identifying participants who have agency, and their, their bodies are not shown in these fragmented, powerless, sexualized manners um, that is so commonly found in, in fictional films that we, we just uh, witnessed and experienced. So can you please speak to the difference between documentary practice and fiction filmmaking, noting it's clearly possible to construct stories that don't fall back on the tired visual language of Hollywood. As an experimental filmmaker, can you talk about how that kind of radical cinema has long provided an alternative to Hollywood film language and storytelling? That's a lot, right? <laughs> so I also wanted to thank Facets for screening this wonderful film and for putting on this event, so it's a real honor to be part of this. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about this uh, because as a documentarian I feel we have a different approach to filmmaking than fiction filmmakers do. Uh, we do uh, engage with the real in a very different way. Uh, we um, you know, tend to not invent stories, hopefully, but we're shaping stories for sure. Uh, so just philosophically, it's also already a different kind of um, way of thinking about the work. Um, I think what uh, Nina's film does so brilliantly uh, points out that it's not just about you know different kinds of storylines, different kinds of plots, that we need strong female lead characters, but it's kind of what is the visual language to get that across, right? So I was thinking, what, what is the visual language of documentary, right? Um, 
And there's clearly such a variety of documentaries. You know, there's the traditional Talking Heads documentary that you've all seen, right? Uh, you can look at any like documentary series on the streamers where you would basically have the spine of the project is interview sound bites and then they lay a lot of archival material over it. So that's kind of a very conventional way. Uh, it could go all the way to like uh, you know more essay films or uh, observational and cinema verite style films. So there is actually not one one type of approach, I'd argue. But even looking at the conventional interview-driven film, when you frame um, a woman interview subject versus a man or non-binary. Uh, you don't really change the framing, right? It's not that women are only presented with like softer lighting and tighter shots. That's really not the case. So there's a certain uniformity to that. So I'd say that's one <coughs> major difference. And then very style, because that's a lot of the camera work that I've done, that's the kind of work that I enjoy watching, um, tends to be a lot more improvisational in that you might be following characters and you're reacting to what's unfolding in front of the lens. So those kinds of films tend to, you know, they might be shot with kind of the continuity editing system in mind. Oh, I need a reverse shot here at some point, otherwise I can't edit this thing, <coughs> right? But for the most part, you'll see a lot more wide shots in those kinds of films because you get to show participants interacting and you can give context in a wide shot, but in a close-up, you don't know, you know the close-up of this, where is that actually located, right? So just in terms of our approach to filming, has to be necessarily slightly different. And I would argue that it leads to less of that kind of fragmentation and objectification than you would find in fiction films. So that's that's kind of my, my take on that. And then just as a very cursory aside, in terms of experimental work, experimental film has had this very male-dominated canon to a certain degree, but there have also been amazing women filmmakers who have really pushed that form uh, because it allows for a lot more radical approaches, both in terms of content and, and form, and that's a much longer discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, when you were talking about um, how uh, in documentaries you shoot the, the subject, I'm also thinking that a lot of women interviewed are shot with vases of flowers next to them, and men have bookcases. <laughs> I'm mean, just saying. <laughs> right, it's art direction, right. Um, thank you so much. I want to um, uh, get to more, thank you, Inez. I want to get to more solutions here. I also want to mention that uh, when I was first asked to moderate this panel, and thank you so much, this is really a thrill, I thought of Sharon Stone in the 1992 movie, Basic Instinct, where she says she was tricked by director Paul Verhoeven uh, when her genitals were prominent in a scene that uh, she did not know until the screening of that wow. film. And she says now nearly 30 years later, she at the, mo at the time she spoke out about it and said she slapped the director and tried to get it removed from the film, but ultimately relented. And um, her solution, of course, could have been to damn the film, but she didn't, though she has been speaking out about it for three decades. So Nina, um, I want to ask you, what do you see as solutions to this historic legacy of diminishing such images of characters identifying as women? And can we start with what all directors can do? Well, my um, what I feel very strongly about is um, that consciousness is transformational consciousness is illuminating and and you know those of us you know who may have been in psychoanalysis or therapy i'm sure you've you've had that experience on a very personal level that you know somebody somebody sort of shined a light somewhere that you never saw before and things change um so what i hope with brainwash is um, not that it's prescriptive. I'm not trying to tell anybody what to do. You know, as I say in the film, I'm not the sex police. And if you want to pick up a camera and zoom in on a woman's derriere, um, that is your right. Go ahead and do it, but please do it with the awareness 
of the context that you're doing it in. And the context is 120 years where that's 96% of what we've seen. So I think that the interesting thing that I've heard from audiences um, as I've traveled with the film is that a lot of people kind of knew it they kind of knew it, you know, they kind of knew it mainly. They think of like B movies, you know, Adam Sandler. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Advertisement, music videos. We know that women are objectified in these kind of films, but most people are taken aback when they realize that it's, it's the masterpieces. And that's when you sort of go like, oh, you know, I've so internalized this that I never noticed. I never noticed it was so normalized. So my, my solution um, is to become aware. And once you are aware, then make your choices. You know, I am very much against the idea of telling people how to make creative work. But I think that with awareness, with illumination, with consciousness, that will begin to shift. You know, there was there was a guy um, in the yeah. screening the other day, and I, I don't know if we'll have time to get to the audience questions today, but, you know, I'd love to hear your uh, people here, how they reacted. But, you know, he came up to me and he said, you know, I'm in film school. It was a black guy. He said, I'm in film school and we've been studying a lot about representation um, in terms of characters, in terms of story, but I never questioned that method of shot design. I never thought about it because those are, again, you know, it's this masterpiece story, it's the canon. Um, so I feel like what I, what I say in the film at the end, it's, you know, you can't really teach this in five minutes, but what I, what I say at the end of the film and what I try to convey to my students when I'm teaching is the idea that instead of just copying what you've seen before, you know? What happens if you listen inward and find the truth of a shot from a very kind of private and personal way of looking? So my private and personal way of, you know, maybe there's a, you know, somebody in a coffee shop writing a poem with the light shining a certain way and that is, electrifying to you as a director. That's, that's where desire is awoken. Why does desire have to be only coded? This is how you shoot desire. So if, if people, and this is really a larger question than shot design, it's a question for our whole society. And you know, it's how do you have your own perception of not only the world, but you know, your own experience, your own experience. My own experience is, is, is mediated by messages that I get from, from all over the place. And most of those messages are not exactly the most progressive or liberating messages. So both how do I see the world and how do I experience myself is, is something that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to focus on and even know what do I, feel? I mean, I think Angela Carter in her wonderful book, um, The Sadian Woman and the Ideology of Pornography, she said, you know, do you have the courage to believe in your own experiences? This is step one. Do you have the courage? Okay, so if you have the courage to believe in your own experience, then how am I going to get a shot of that experience. What would, be, what would be the truth of my experience as translated into a shot? All right, thank you. I think I'm that. out of time on my, on my answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And yes, we are gonna have time for audience questions. And I, I do really appreciate that a perception and awareness affects everything. It's like uh, for the first time when you eat at uh, not just your, parents cooking at home, you eat at someone else's house, it's like, wow, this is good. <laughs> <laughs> My mother knew she wasn't a good cook. So, that's good. <laughs> so um, I want to follow up with uh, what Nina is suggesting. Uh, 
um, with you, Michelle. Um, in your experience, what do you see as solutions to eliminating this crisis of point of view? Um, yeah, so for me personally, um, I started a film festival, basically. Like, I was like, okay, Hollywood is just not accepting of women or gender non-binary folks or transgender folks or queer folks or disabled folks or BIPOC folks. Um, so, you know, in um, 2015, I reached out to one of my colleagues, um, Susan Kearns, who is um, an associate professor um, in cinema at Columbia College and also now um, an associate provost, um, and said, look, like, let's start our own film festival. So we started the Chicago Feminist Film Festival specifically to support um, folks who are underrepresented in mainstream cinema. Um, our film festival ran from 2016 until 2019, um, and then the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, and um, we, um, haven't been able to get our festival back off the ground again. Um, but basically, um, you know, this solution of, um, you know, creating a space for, um, you know, women, trans, and gender non-binary filmmakers to show their films. Um, we um, were mostly a, a short film festival because, you know, what, what we haven't talked about yet too is about is funding um, and who gets most of the money, not just in Hollywood, but also in independent filmmaking as well. Um, it tends to go to men to make these you know, feature films and the kind of funding that like women and gender non-binary folks can get is um, funding to make short films, basically. So we were predominantly a short film festival. We showed a handful of feature films, but we're trying to meet filmmakers where they're at with the resources that they have. And we spent a lot of um, funding also trying to give funding to filmmakers so that they could attend the festival and meet other filmmakers and network and talk to audiences and have conversations and basically build what I would describe as an activist film festival space, right? The, the limitation to that though, how it, you know, is that we're not Hollywood and we're not Sundance and we're not Khan. And so we're not also, you know, these big festivals that have, you know, distribution um, um, and, and uh, you know, funding for folks and, and, you know, like big funding for folks and, um, and so on and so forth. Um, but I also think, um, you know, these kinds of spaces are incredibly important for helping underrepresented filmmakers know that they're not alone and that there are audiences out there who do want to see the kind of work that they're producing, who want to hear the stories that they have to tell. Um, yeah. I'll stop there. So <laughs> the Thank you, Michelle. Um, I want to get back to you, Maria. Can you talk to us about the progress not only you're making directly with your advocacy and work, but also what do you see happening in filmmaking today? Um, well, let's see. Um, it's a great question. Um, the change has been absolutely explosive. The EEOC investigation began in October of 2015, and then um, the ACLU believes that they filed commissioner's charges uh, about a year and a half later. And um, if you file a commissioner's charge, it can go one of two ways. Um, you, the, the, the industry could have got, got into settlement talks with the EEOC, um, to the extent that they were satisfied. If the EEOC wasn't satisfied, then they would file a lawsuit and it would have moved into the court system, uh, which is kind of, I was hoping <laughs> that would happen. Um, but in fact, uh, it went into settlement talks. So from 2017 until 2019, you saw extraordinary in unbelievable change. Um, the Directors Guild, for example, that had very few women in governance, um, came to have, uh, you know, an, an even more women than men, uh, delegates and almost 
equal number of uh, women and men on the board of directors. Um, the number of women directors and particularly women directors of color um, in episodic television skyrocketed from 13% to 38% um, in feature films. It went from, you know, 1.9, 3.5, you know, 4% um, to, uh, I guess it was, uh, I think it was 18%. Women were directing studio features, Wonder Woman, you know, woman, you know, all these, uh, there's just an unbelievable phenomenal amount of change. And then organizations, uh, corporations like Procter and Gamble made a pledge in 20. 19 to have 50% women directors of all of their commercials globally. So um, we see that there was just a, a staggering amount of change. And also Hollywood um, was very, very uh, alarmed and, and they were rocked by these investigations. Liberal democratic Hollywood did not want to look like one of the worst violators of Title VII of any industry in the United States, which I was able to demonstrate. And um, so they began to scramble to create all these organizations that we now see like the Hollywood Commission, which was started by Steven Spielberg's partner, uh, uh, Kathleen Kennedy, and who brought Anita Hill as the president. CAA agency started Time's Up, which then, you know, they formed into their own, you know, narrative, their own movement. Um, and of course, the New York Times, after suppressing the Harvey Weinstein story for 13 years from 2003 to 2017, um, suddenly, you know, uh, was were emboldened um, to to publish the exposés that started the Me Too movement, and um, you know this the this is extraordinary change. And of course, part of that, you know, had to do with the fact that Hillary Clinton was out of office in 2016, and Harvey Weinstein was one of her biggest donors. So there were a lot of reasons that the New York Times. But what you see is just how entrenched. Hollywood is with the news media and Washington DC and who is making the films is so important to that to them it, to 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 our country it's more or less a propaganda machine for one of the most powerful countries in the world and keep keeping control over who's creating the content is a matter of geopolitical concern so it's extremely you know profound and important if we can find ways individually and as as a group to to change this to to keep up with their manipulating the narrative right thanks and it's interesting also to note maria that he said she said is now a feature film Right. <laughs> That's correct. Right. Yeah. Can, that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they got a lot of mileage out of that. That's for sure. <laughs> right. Thank you, um, uh, Rebecca. Let's hear about what you suggest as solutions and steps you're taking to make changes, not only in the process of shooting characters, but in the filmmaking industry as a whole, where it's predictable that many are seen as only fragmented objects. Sure. Um, you know, I think actually you you just mentioned the film uh, she said, which is in theaters now, and I, I I think this audience maybe I won't do the who's seen it because I feel like this is a very intelligent audience who goes and sees films made by diverse filmmakers. But um, you know, the news headline last week was that no one saw it. You know, it opened into a void, and no one saw this film, which is a, a very powerful film about the Harvey Weinstein story. It is it is about the women who wrote the article that uncovered the story, even with all, everything that um, Maria just mentioned, all of those those um, barriers, they still were able to break the story and, and really make change that we're seeing still reverberate today. But the headline on IndieWire on Monday morning was like, you know, she said tanks, like no one wants to see this story. So I guess what I would say in, in a solution uh, oriented kind of uh, perspective is to go see movies that aren't made by cis white men. I, I think that's a huge thing. That's something that all of us can do individually. I think Maria or maybe Nina, somebody, somebody said, you know, um, what can we do individually? And I think that's, it's where your dollars are. And you can certainly feel like your $10 ticket or your $15 ticket isn't going to do that much. But I think 
it is, it is that cultural competency, it is that intelligence, it is that consciousness raising that you can do for yourself. I can't raise your consciousness, you can't raise mine necessarily, but we can certainly share stories that do raise consciousness and prioritize those. I go to see you know, all the Marvel movies. I love those, they're super fun. But I also try to go and see films that are going to challenge me, um, that are not going to objectify the characters that they're putting on, on the you know, huge screens. Um, I try to do that, to have that balanced diet and really that is consciousness raising. I try to program films that raise consciousness and challenge and question. Um, because I do feel like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, it's like if a woman is object objectified and nobody's in the theater to see it, like, was she objectified? Like, you know, if we don't give that money, if we don't give our dollars to films that just keep perpetuating this cycle, um, and filmmakers who keep perpetuating the cycle, sometimes very, very publicly have been, you know, have had accusations or, and worse. Um, and continue to make films by big distributors and big money and people still go see these movies and it sort of like blows my mind um, because we are the change makers, we are the stakeholders, we are the, the power holders. Um, I know sometimes it can not feel that way. I certainly sometimes feel very powerless as a, as a film exhibitor fighting with distributors who have sometimes seemingly all the power. But um, I think there is a way to just continue to raise that consciousness. And like, you know, at Christmas dinner, like be like, after dinner, we're gonna watch Brainwashed, Grandma, <laughs> Grandpa. Like sit down, I'm gonna show you this film. I mean, like that is, those are those moments that you can actually really kind of like shift the narrative. And then maybe your like uncle will be like, you know what, I am gonna go check out the local documentary, my cinema, because I saw Brainwashed at Christmas and it really made me think, you know? <laughs> so I think like these are things that we can all do. And they seem like small, small things and you know, again, a $10 ticket might not seem that much, but I think that is all consciousness raising and is a collective consciousness that we can continue to really fight for and bang the drum about. Um, because again, truly, like, you know, a film like she said should not be the, the, the film that didn't succeed. It is films by, and I will not name those filmmakers here to give them even space, but it's those films by filmmakers who have been, you know, on the record uh, abusive or on the record um, negligent uh, or neglectful on their sets, those should not be making the money. It is movies like Brainwash, it is movies like she said that um, sh should get attention and should get all the air in the room. Thank you for that. And then if you're uh, observed that the uncle who watched Brainwash <laughs> doesn't get it or uh, laughs at it, was like, I don't get I don't understand. Just that. start it again. Right. Just, <laughs> just, 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 just yeah, rewind. Or never sit next to him at any family <laughs> gathering. So um, thanks for that. Now, Inez, as one of only very few identifying as female documentary cinematographers in town, and thank you for who you are and what you do, this is luckily changing with uh, younger generations. Documentary, as you note, is quite different from a fiction filmmaking, but can you briefly speak to the experience of working as a cinematographer in a uh, cis male dominated field? Sure, so I stopped doing camera work for other people about seven years ago when I started teaching full time because it's just not compatible. You can't, I can juggle some things, but <laughs> it just got to be too much. So I think when I started out in the mid to late 90s, I really was only aware of two other uh, women cinematographers in town working in documentary, and that didn't change for a long time. I know. Now, with the next generation, there are a lot of uh, younger women who uh, do camera work, which is great. I think part of that is maybe that perception, you know, it's technology, it's, um, oh, it's heavy equipment, you have to have such endurance and strength, and, you know, cameras are smaller now, so that actually, you know, I know from teaching some of my female students that some of the equipment is heavy, and it is hard to imagine holding a camera for many hours, so there's maybe a tiny bit of truth to that, but um, I think the fact that there were so few of us here uh, probably had to do with how you find work uh, in the industry, which is very much the word of mouth and through connections, right? It's not that you just can go on a job board and easily find the next gig uh, if you're freelancing. And it is a boys club, so it's really quite hard to break into that. So I think that had to do with it, the perception of what the work actually is. Um, and I'd say another aspect uh, is has to do with if you have children. I mean, it's the kind of industry where your hours are not set, so it's really difficult to juggle, you know, childcare with 
maybe being on a shoot that is going, they told you it'll last eight hours, but 14 hours later you're still there, you know, so what do you do? Do you have a sitter who can just jump in? And, you know, those are really challenging uh, encounters. So unless, you know, that kind of changes in terms of parity of childcare and what kind of resources there are, I think it will be hard for women who are mothers to, to actually really succeed in this. I just read this article about Sarah Poli's new work, uh, talking to women, me, talking. Oh, women talking, and that she didn't think she could take on the project because of childcare. Right? She's like, I, I can't imagine raising my kids and then being so, you know, having to spend so many hours a day away. Uh, so she negotiated that they would have 10 hour days, which is incredible for this industry. So that really made a huge difference. And I think if we can see that kind of change, it will really open the field up more too. Um, I want to also build on something that uh, Michelle said about, you know, organizing a film festival. I really believe that filmmakers also can become a lot more powerful if we band together. So um, I've been running a documentary conference in town and monthly meetups for local documentarians. And, you know, although it's not explicitly under, you know, like a fe feminist collective kind of uh, uh, umbrella, I think there is uh, a lot that we can change if we band together and kind of figure out, you know, both on, you know, being overlooked at mis Midwestern filmmakers in terms of funding, in terms of, of the resources that we have, uh, and even in terms of like giving each other feedback on what kind of cinematic language do we use. So, thank you for that. Maybe um, give your uh, information on social so if people want to sure. reach out to you on that. Thanks for that. Um, so uh, we've been uh, speaking out about this topic, Nina, you've been talking about it to broad audiences around the world since at least 2017. And you s said, I just saw Brainwash for the first time today, so uh, I heard you say it's built on your sadness about how the industry has been for more than a century. Um, so how have audiences received your ideas and your suggestions? I'm curious about, I mean, you've got a lot of love in this room. I don't know if you can feel it. Can we, can we share some of that? So, um, I, I'm curious about pushback um, as well as support. And then I want to ask uh, the obvious question, is it going to take 120 years to reverse the mandate? Well, the, uh, you know, the response to the film has been quite, extraordinary um when when i was getting ready you know when we were getting sort of to the end of the editing and getting ready to submit to film festivals um you know i was like well we're gonna send it to sundance um and sundance has shown a lot of my films in the past but you never know and i i didn't know if if they were gonna step up or if they were gonna be afraid you know, and we include the Robert Redford clip in there, you know, and we're like, well, maybe they're not going to take it. But we were invited to Sundance and we were invited to the Berlinale and we were invited to, you know, what are considered sort of the so-called top film festivals of the world. And so we were like, oh, okay, you know, go team. Like people are ready to hear this was, was our feeling. Um, in terms of audience reactions um every time i've a attended a live screening it's it's been quite extraordinary i mean there people are really excited about it and i've, I've often been approached um with uh women in tears like literally crying sometimes sobbing <laughs> and there was this girl just a few days ago who said she was a child actress in really, really big films. Now she's 20. And she was she was weeping and she was like, oh my God, this is, you know, it's it's like I didn't have a language and now I do. So I've heard a lot about, I've heard a lot of that. I've heard a lot of um excitement and appreciation, even from uh we had a screening in Vienna 
at, there was like a feminist weekend and this was a gender studies uh, feminist weekend. So it's a very sophisticated people, sophisticated on the level of gender, sophisticated on the level of cinema. Um, and they seem to love it. We got a standing ovation for like five minutes. And so, and, and, and when you're like, well, don't those people already know, but what they felt was, uh, and I've heard this also before, which is, you know, even if you've read Laura Mulvey and you've read, you know, all these other texts, it's different when you see 200 clips one after another. <laughs> and, you know, in this like, kind of like, it's, it's, a, it's a different level of understanding and feeling it. Um, okay, so so we've had, you know, and then we've had a lot of um, support um, from critics. We've also had some uh, attacks. And I think that, that, you know, I guess I didn't really think that you could argue with this film, to be honest. It's like, how can you argue? With, how, I mean, are you going to say like, you're wrong. You can't say that I'm wrong because I just proved it, you know? So then, <laughs> like, right. like so what are they going to do, you know? So then they sort of attack me, like, oh, she's just an egomaniac. She put only her own films in there as good examples. I mean, quite a few people have said that. I'm like, did you watch the film? There's 30 good examples, uh, you know, 30 different directors as alternative examples. So I feel like the, the people who are pushing back, I feel like maybe, I mean, if I may be so bold, um, <laughs> they maybe didn't want to face the pain the struggle and the sadness that you have to face if you watch this film. So then it's just like, kill the messenger. That's right. <laughs> can, I, right. can I add one yeah. thing to that, Michelle? Yeah, sure, sure. Sure. I, just, I just wanted to say, I mean, because this is, there's never been a movie made like Brainwashed ever. I mean, we are living in a time where you know, this is all, you know, new and being able to communicate it. I wanted to say that the um, uh, the director of Sundance Film Festival and the director of Berlin All, too, when they accepted Brainwashed, they said, we watched Brainwashed pretty early in the selection period, and it completely transformed our selection of all the other films. And if that doesn't tell wow. you... Mm. Yeah, if that doesn't, you know, tell you the, the potential influence of this film, I mean, it's, it's going, it really is going to change uh, everything, <laughs> I think. Right, thank you, thank you. So in honor of time, so that we get to the q and I'm going to ask each one of you to uh, please limit your response to um, 30 seconds, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to start with you, Inez. Uh, do you feel hopeful? about the future of filmmaking and switching. Oh, for sure. You know, like encountering students all the time who are trying to figure out new ways of storytelling is incredibly encouraging. I think this film will be tremendous because students are maybe thinking about different kinds of storylines, but not necessarily how they can tell them in a different manner, right? So I think as soon as it comes out on the educational market, <laughs> I want a copy for us. Thank you. Um, can I jump in and, and, and oh, give some okay. dates on that? Um, we will be streaming on Canopy, the educational streamer, um, and on Kino Lorber's Kino Now, which is their private streaming service, starting December 6th. And then starting December 20th, um, we'll be out on iTunes and, and you know all the rest. So. I just, I just want to let people know. Um. Thank you. And now I'm directing. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, 30 seconds. Um, yes, I am cautiously um, hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful because I wouldn't do the work that I've been doing if I wasn't hopeful. And one of the things that I tell my students too is that culture um, and gender and race um, and power as part of culture is um, not static and fixed. It's fluid and it's mutable, and we have the power through um, 
um, through um, our, our actions to make incremental change over time. Um, but the cautious part is that, yes, this has been a dominant and predatory, I love that, that phrasing, predatory way of seeing in cinema for 100 years. And really, like, longer than that in, um, in Western culture um, has existed for hundreds of years. Um, John Berger is another uh, theorist writing around the same time as Laura Mulvey who writes about the male gaze in European Renaissance art. So I think we, we have a lot that we're up against, but yes, I am hopeful. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, I, I'm uh, just a always optimistic person, which is probably bad, but um, I, you know, I am, I, you know, and I think about audiences and critics all the time, so I have to bring up something sort of monumental that happened this week, which is the UK Sight and Sound poll. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this, so there's a Sight and Sound magazine, and every year they do like the top 100 films, and it's the film, the, the list is curated, is, cur is, is created by uh, critics and film scholars who send their tops, you know, and then through that it's, you know, I'm sure it's a very democratic process with ballots and things. But um, uh, Chantal Ackerman's film, Jean Delman, which we see a small moment of uh, in, in Brainwash, um, took the top spot over Vertigo, uh, which is Alfred Hitchcock's film about obsession and about the male gaze and is like the, per I mean, it's, I think it's one of the first clips that Nina uses in this film because it's so perfectly uh, uh, personifies her point. Um, and so the Jean Delman, which is a film that just shows a woman, you know, marinating steak and, and making beds and cleaning her home, uh, and is three plus hours long and, and is playing at the film center in a few weeks um, uh, and is a in theater experience to, to have um, that it, it unseated Hitchcock and I love Vertigo that it unseated it, that's a great thing that's a great thing because the critics and the film scholars who, who did that um, are the ones who are in classrooms and they're the ones who are writing reviews and they're the ones that whose reviews sometimes make, make a filmmaker get their next job so I think that that is very hopeful and it also meant that um, my mom texted to me and the, the link and she said, do you know anything about this film? And, she went, and I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll call you. So that's great. That was a conversation that I didn't expect to have on a, a Tuesday afternoon. So. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to open um, this up to questions. First of all, thanks to uh, the panel and our virtual Charles, are you um, able to help us out with it? Um, so please direct your question to the panelist or, uh, you know, by name so that um, we can get as many questions in as possible. Well, due to a secret lottery, we have these young people from a group called Film Fatal, and they actually get to pose the first question, and where are they? <laughs> I got to sit next to you during that. <laughs> I'm sitting next to you. Yeah. Um, um, I first would like to say um, I'm Kylie, and next to me is uh, Lean and Sada, and we're both we are both women film directing students at DePaul University. We are part of this um, club organization at our school called DePaul Film Fates House, which is a club that supports women and non-binary filmmakers. So to be here. Uh, I can't even, I don't know, I can't put that into words, but um, we have a question that we prepared um, for you. Um, we know that you've answered, uh, you, we, you've answered some of this already, but what else is the industry doing to structurally dismantle uh, this objectifying and predatory way of filmmaking? And what can we do as film students and as leaders of this club and organization do to implement, you know, changes at our institution. And who would you like to uh, direct that question to? Anyone who raises their hand first. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah. Nina? Oh, me? Um, I, you know, I mean, I, I think I did answer, um, you know, my, um, I mean, let me give you a, a self-centered answer. Uh, make sure everyone sees brainwashed. Um, it it really it really can have an impact if if the film spreads. Um, that's as far as film language. 
Um, as you know, as far as the other changes, I think we've we've really talked about it here. You know, it's on every level. It's on the level of teaching. It's on the level of exhibition. It's on the level of you know employment parity. Um, if you're if your teacher, if you have a teacher who's showing only you know white cis male masterpieces, you know, complain. Um, you know, there's it's it's really. You know, we are, as you know, I, I mentioned in the film, you know, Foucault talks about these webs of ideology. We are trapped in these webs of ideology and they all reinforce each other. So, and we've touched on all of those points here today. Funding, distribution, film festivals, exhibition, going to see films, putting your money where your dollar is, showing people brainwashed, telling, you know. So all, you know, they're all, all of these things, the more people who are aware, the more people who bring that perspective to bear um, on their own life, with their friends, in the classroom, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that, that it will, I mean, it will have an impact. And please also uh, try to watch um, This Changes Everything. It's a 2018 film directed by Tom Donahue and it's on Netflix and it is, um, uh, a really, really important film to watch to understand uh, gender in Hollywood. It's a movie about the work I did and, and Gina Davis did um, for, for employment equality in Hollywood. And it's really, really helpful in addition to Brainwashed. Um, Nina, can I ask you, this is, this is Michelle, Michelle Yates um, on the panel. So um, what are your thoughts about um, intimacy coordination and its effect on um, the industry um, as well. I noticed that you you interviewed an intimacy coordinator in your film, so I'm wondering your thoughts about that as well, because I think that's also a pretty important change that has happened in the industry, right? Oh yeah, I think it's huge because, you know, what was, what was considered standard um, before all of these changes that we've been discussing here is, you know, usually, um, it, it, you know, we're talking about a heterosexual so-called love scene, or you know, <laughs> I shouldn't even use that word, you know, some sort of sex scene, which is usually a rape scene. Um, so what would happen is that, and we've heard this over and over again, you know, where the director would say, well, we want an authentic performance. So we just sprung it on this woman, <laughs> you know, well, like we didn't tell her that he's going to stick his finger up her dress and pull down her underwear and do this and do this you know like you didn't tell her I mean so it was like sexual assault for the camera to get a more real result I mean that's I mean when you think about it it's kind of mind-boggling it's like do you if you're going to have a shootout scene do you use real bullets to use get a more real result <laughs> you know I mean, like, hello. <laughs> yeah. So um, anyway, the thing is, is that intimacy coordination takes the mystique, um, which is a fake mystique, out of sex scenes. And, you know, the way that I, I talk about this and, it, it, you know, this idea that like glamour and mystique around sex and, you know, is all ways to keep you down, you know? And um, so, so when you shine a light on the scene, like through an intimacy coordinator, right? Well, it takes away some of that fake mystique. And then you're gonna really have something that's gonna be really different. And, and you know, what, when you think back the way sex scenes were shot, with, you know, like an all-male crew and an all-male director, you know, and a heterosexual love scene with a naked woman. <laughs> I mean, this is mind-boggling when you yeah. think about it. Thank you, Nina. So, yeah, I think it's very important and, and it, will, it will force change. Thanks. A, a, question, a, a question for, for Nina. I recall there was one scene of a version of you'll never work in this town again by an actor, right? And I'm wondering if a streaming service offers you opportunity to do a multi-episode extended version of this, could you get similar anecdotes from 
people doing lighting, from editors, from costume designers, who can testify from their own professional, you know, vantage, uh, further iterations of this. But then I thought, well, might they all just be able to say, just following orders? And so that the locus is really the producers who are employing all of the people who are being professionally obedient to all to this nexus of codes. Um, yes, <laughs> yes to all. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, even yes to the fact that that um, I do have a TV series concept that um, I'm in the process of developing along with um, the editor of this film, Cecily Rett. And, and we are in the process of um, pitching it to streamers. Um, so actually it's happening, um, or I hope it's gonna be happening. Uh, I think there is a huge interest in it. And there's so many side streets that you could go down. You know, you could go down the, the side street of like, what are the experiences of the people behind the camera, you know, on, on the level of sexual harassment and assault. You could go down the side street of, you know, how does the male gaze function when it's a queer gaze, you know, when it's a, a, you know, a woman desiring a woman, is it going to be shot just the same way? You know, I mean, there's so many side streets you can go down. Um, you know, brainwashed really is a starting off point. It's a jumping off point. It should start a conversation like we're having here today. It's not supposed to be the final word. It's supposed to open up a discussion. Um, and, um, yeah, so more films can be made on this subject. We didn't, we did not, um, what's the word, you know, use it up. Right. Thank you, Nina. <laughs> want to get, I want to get other questions. I left out screenwriters because in a sense, That's they right. are, they Thank are the you. ones who are authorizing That's right. the implementation of this code by making it important to have that particular scene in. That's and right. And then the cinematographer is just following codes, right? That's right. Yeah. It's a system. Uh, we want to get to more questions from who else has questions? Anyone else? Any questions? Yeah. Hi, uh, this question is for Maria. Um, I am wondering, you know, as a, a male gaze is not just, um, you know, a function of the patriarchy, it's an example of the patriarchy. And I think that um, you and Nina do a great job of showing how just having diversity in the filmmaking business doesn't necessarily negate the male gaze. So how long do you think, you know, what kind of percentage of diversity in filmmaking would need to actually make a cultural shift to how actually women see themselves? I mean, I think you brought up a good example, you know, of how you have a student or somebody that always describes, you know, always thinks of themselves being seen when they're showering. And I think that I've talked to a lot of women that have that experience, and that started for me when I was prepubescent. Mm -hmm. So obviously the male gaze is something that is in my head always. And so how, I mean, are we waiting for a generational shift before we can actually see a change there? Or do you think that that could happen sooner with just more representation? And thank you so much for uh, coming. Yeah, you're welcome. It's such a profound and excellent question. Um, you know, it's it's all so tied up, and I think Nina speaks to this, you know, even much more articulately than I do. But you know, we we women also objectify ourselves. You know, we're we're all kind of mired in in this, it's, you know, in this entrenched system. So indeed, how long will it take? And I think the first question that Michelle asked, uh, you know, is. Um, when we start, when we started this conversation, um, and I can't even remember what I was just about to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> but um, I guess what I'm trying to say is that uh, this is brainwashed is the beginning, and and how long it's it's going to take. It's that's right. It's a matter of diversity of voice. If we can use, you know, get very, very diverse voices hired in those positions to tell our stories, 
then we're going to be distributing diverse images and perspectives and voices all around the world. And that's what's going to change things. And I would also say, you know, the, the advent of the iPhone and an uh, infinite number of distribution channels on, on online is making it possible for the global democratization of, of our storytelling. So I think we're at the beginning of extraordinary change. I think technologically, we're at the almost at the point of a singularity where everything is going to be able to shift. And, and I think we, we, we need to be really vigilant uh, uh, about. Thank you so much for that. And um, thank you everyone here today. We have a, a saying at the Op-Ed Project that whoever tells the story writes history. So I think that uh, crosses across all industries. So thank you so much, Nina and Maria for your work and Inez and Michelle, Rebecca for your brilliant insights today. And thank you so much, Charles and Karen for today. And thank you to the audience for your great questions. <laughs> and thank you. Um, can, I, can I just uh, shout out and say, I, you know, we can't see the audience from our, from our Zoom. Um, and I'm sure a lot more of you had thoughts. Um, please feel free to reach out on Instagram. We're at, at, um, at Brainwashed Movie and at Minkus Film. And we'd love to hear from you. And, and, you know, thanks for being here today. And thanks to Facets and the whole team. Thank you. The audience Thank you. is waving at you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all.